What's up fellas? In this video, we're gonna check out this new pump that I've built. It's made out of an air compressor. And basically the way it works is kind of like a super soaker squirt gun. It has a secondary air tank on it that will pressurize this tank, which will be filled with a fluid. Depending on what I'm using it for, it is gonna either have water in it or, or waste oil. And we're gonna be seeing this thing operating today and I also have some clips of uh, me building this thing. There's a lot of useful information in that process. You might wanna check that out. And I'm also gonna explain why I would do this. Why would I build this thing? Why wouldn't I just buy a gear motor or something? Well, first of all, pumping water at high pressure at specific flow rates is not an easy thing to do with the available pumps out there. They're either too big or they're too expensive. It's always one or the other. Now I have an, a waste oil pump that I built here a long time ago. That's just a cooling fan there. And the problem with this thing is it's too big. It pumps too much oil. First of all, even if it was small enough with a small enough flow rate, it seems I can only get about 50 PSI's out of this thing it starts to have problems maybe that's just the way I'm running it but it'll lock up but at any rate it has to run at such a slow rpm that it gets really hot and this thing did not come with cooling ducts in it by the way I had to drill those in there myself so this thing had some way of cooling itself that's what all this jazz is about I have another air duct going to my PWM so this motor cost me about $50 or this pump I'm sorry and it just won't run waste oil burners. I had it hooked up to this waste oil burner here that I have several videos on. I'll post a link in the description to this particular unit. It's a very nice unit, works very well, but the pump clogged up on me and I thought that it was just a bad idea from the get-go. The total cost of this whole thing, um, I wanna say this was like $15, maybe less bought this at Lowe's or Menards it's for filling up air mattresses basically this cost $50 I know that there those diodes are probably five to ten dollars a piece this is just a universal transformer I use this for all kinds of builds but it was the only thing with the high enough amperage and voltage to run this unit but as I said, this thing had to run at such a slow rate, it would still get hot. And even then, it still just couldn't pump oil at a low enough flow rate at the right pressure. If you got down to the low enough flow rate, it wasn't the right pressure. In addition to that, I've also tried the bypass valve method, which is where you would have oil flowing to a nozzle that would spray oil into say your waste oil burner or whatever. And then you would crack this valve open and some of that oil would bypass back to the tank or through a heat system, a heat exchange to heat the oil up. But at any rate, you would take a high flow pump and could thereby reduce the flow rate of the pump by the bypass valve method. This didn't fare so well for me. It's too touchy of a system. The simple, maybe thousandth of an inch of a turn on a needle valve can throw the system out of whack. It, it was crazy. I mean, it was just too touchy of a system to be practical. Didn't like it at all. This is a nice little pump, but um, just uh, wasn't effective at all for the waste oil burners that I've used. And in addition to that, it can't pump water at high pressure. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Also on waste oil burners, I have used the drip feed method, which is effective but has its limitations and it's going to produce a pulsating burn. And if you have a high power system with a lot of pressure, this just can't do it. It, it, it can only run on very low pressure combustion chambers. So, it's good for very small burners or for like heating applications, but for forges and things like that, it's just not good. You really want to be able to dial in your system. 
Now, this particular setup here is a siphon air nozzle, and it uses an air compressor to pump its oil. It doesn't have a pump. We just use compressor or an air compressor to blast air through this needle, which then siphons oil through that pin stock. Problem with these units are is that adjusting the air to fuel ratio is very touchy business. It's not something one can do on the fly very easily. It can shut the system down. It um, just is nowhere near as easy as the systems that have blowers. So if you've seen any of the videos of my systems that use an air blower and an oil pump in tandem, those systems are the only systems that can be throttled like infinitely from low to high. The um, siphon nozzles are, are not very easily modulated I'm finding. You can modulate them with air pressure, but what I'm talking about is the air to fuel ratio. Any of you guys who've ever built any of the blower type waste oil burners like this, you know what I'm talking about. I could turn the oil way down and the air way up and get a very small, super white hot flame coming out this side. Very loud, powerful flame. Or I can turn the air all the way up and turn the oil all the way up, which would shoot 10 foot flames out of that nozzle. And it's a very low roar flame. Not very high power at all. Very fuel rich, but massive in size. So you can't do that with these, uh, these atomizer units. These uh, things are, are a different beast. <laughs> They're just a different beast altogether. This is also a siphon nozzle that we will be seeing in operation as soon as it warms up again. And what I'm doing here with this dial indicator is I am dialing in the sweet spot of this nozzle's position. It seems that every specific nozzle has its own little home and it only likes to live there. So what I do is once I've determined that position, I will build a frame onto the stand here and extract the dial indicator after the stand's been built. So we will be removing this from the build once we've found that sweet spot. Or I might find out that it's nice to be able to keep that in an adjustment mode and I'll build some kind of adjustable stand similar to what I did with the other siphon nozzle that goes on this unit, which is this one here. This one here was determined to be right at about 41 degree angle and about 17 millimeters from the side of the burner here. That was like the only place that would burn really well. Anywhere else and it was very unstable would blow out easily during modulation and things like that You couldn't throttle it without it dying, you know stuff like that. That's what Finding that sweet spots all about and people are constantly asking me. Why do I got this stupid 90 on here? Just use a straight pipe. Well guys, it won't work without that 90 There is something about the turbulence induced from this 90 degree angle in the ejector that um it just causes the, the perfect back pressure to keep from blowing the flame right out of the tube. I can't get it to work in a straight pipe. I've given up. And this is um, actually an essential design feature to these miniature units. And the purpose of this miniature burner being so important is the fact that the flame goes where the work is. It's not being wasted inside some massive combustion chamber. If you want to run one of these on a forge, this is the design for you. All the flame would be in your forge, not inside some huge combustion chamber. Because that fireball that you're running inside that massive combustion chamber can be running as much as 100,000 kilowatts in energy. That's very possible. I've done the math. So, <laughs> let me walk you through what we've got going on here. Essentially what happens is, we have this compressor which is running into this air reservoir. There's a check valve inside right there. And this air reservoir is the actual air tank of the compressor now. 
this is no longer the actual air tank. And the reason for that is that allows us to run pressure through the regulator into the tank. And by doing that, we are able to regulate the pressure that's inside the tank. Let's say I want to pump water at right around 90 PSI's. I would set the regulator at about probably 95, 100 PSI's and it would run right around 90 PSI's. Cause you have to set it a little bit higher than what you actually want it to run at. Cause the second you run the air, the needle will drop. So at any rate, this thing will allow me to pump oil or water at an almost infinite variable between just a little drip at 100 PSI or up to 135 PSI, take that back, all the way up to who knows what the, the, the highest flow rate's gonna be. This compressor is very small, so it's not gonna have a huge flow rate, but it is gonna be plenty, more than enough to run a waste oil burner. And also, when it's gonna be pumping water, it's going to be running this steam coil. I have some videos on this that if you haven't seen yet, you definitely gotta check out. What this is, it goes on the end of a blowtorch and you pump water into it. And it is a steam cleaner, degreaser tool that cleans engine parts and greasy stuff like you would not believe. It is very effective. I cleaned a chainsaw up that I was working on and uh, it did so well that that's another reason I decided to build this pump because I'm going to be building a miniature steam cleaner system. A gentleman asked me what he thought it would cost to build a unit like that and this video is kind of a response to that because he said some of the commercial units are up to $500 and he's a detailer or something, has a detailing business and he wanted to try and build a small steam cleaning unit and I'm gonna do that in this video coming up here pretty shortly using this particular pump. It's gonna be pumping water though. I'm not worried about this tank rusting out because as soon as I'm done using the tool, the tank will be drained. So I'm not gonna be having water standing inside of this tank. And as far as moisture being in there, the inside of air tanks are continuously sweating with moisture. So it's not gonna hurt the tank. The system's only rated for 115 PSI's or because this is like a 100 PSI compressor, but I beefed it up by changing the transducer to 135 PSI transducer. So now the system will reach 135 PSI before it shuts off. So I'm gonna shut up now and I'm gonna set up a rig that'll allow us to observe the performance of this device. Hopefully I got the point down of why I would build this and why you may wanna do the same if you're interested in working with forges or anything like that and waste oil because this thing, I've got 50 bucks in this, guys. Or actually, it was $56 for this. Where are we at? There we go. Hot dog. Oil is hot dog. $56.99. So, this is about a $60 thing. All these components and stuff would cost you an arm and a leg. But I already had all this stuff. I, I do so many builds that this stuff has been used over and over again. For example, this air tank here was a hydrogen synthesizer in a few videos ago. So, <laughs> or just a few videos ago. So now the other question, if you're asking, well, why don't you just buy a smaller pump? Sounds like a smart thing to do, right? If this pump's too big, because this is the smallest um, gear motor type oil pump, high pressure oil pump I could find for cheap. Well, I've also tried these little gear motor pumps, which work fantastic. This is out of a Swiffer wet jet. You can also buy these online for about $15. Or if you see a Swiffer wet jet sitting in the trash somewhere, you might wanna stop and grab that bad boy because these are really nice little gear pumps that are inside those mops. The problem is when you run this thing at um, a rate of four liters per hour, I know that doesn't sound like much, or even a gallon and a half to two gallons per hour, which is typical for a, a good waste oil burner. If, if running at forged temperatures here, we're not talking about heating applications, guys. 
I don't believe in building waste oil burners for heating applications. It's a waste of your time, unless you've got a couple of oil change facilities in your back pocket. Because you're talking barrels of oil, not gallons, boys. So, these pumps burn up. The transformers that I've built and hooked up to them burn up. The motor gets so hot that I can't believe that it doesn't fry. I haven't actually burnt one of these motors up, but I have got it so hot that it nearly destroyed itself. And it did burn up every transformer I hooked up to it. This transformer here is a little too beefy, the voltage is a little too high. And I also run this system off a of triac, I might add like a router speed controller would be hooked into this transformer <laughs> which is then hooked to a pwm so you see all this absurdity and it still didn't work very well and i can't pump water with it so that's why we're doing this and the reason i cut this motor off is because i decided to cut the motor shell off and leave the armature shaft sticking out of the gear pump and i then connected it to a dremel which I do not see. There it is. And that was my oil pump motor. And because it has a triac circuit speed controller on it, I was able to modulate the speed of this gear pump. Fantastic, right? Wrong. That thing got so hot and nearly caught on fire. Everything was like, this catches on fire because it's too small. That catches on fire because it's too big. That catches on fire. It's like, no matter what I do, I can't pump oil at one gallon per hour. Trust me, guys. I've looked around at so many pumps. You can do it if you've got three, four hundred bucks laying around. But that's not the point of my builds. I, I have to do this on a budget or we ain't doing it all. Anything over a hundred bucks, forget about it. It ain't going to happen. Not with the views I'm getting. So that's the dilemma. If you've ever looked into oil pumps that pump right around a gallon an hour, four liters per hour, whatever you want to call it, you're going to have serious trouble. And I'm talking at pressure, you know, 100 PSI or whatever. Nice little spray of oil. It's just really hard to do. Or even just a dribble of oil is hard to pull off. This thing's very clog prone too, by the way. Just wanted to add that. But um, I am going to stop torturing you now with this continuous yapping and we're going to watch this thing work. Okay, so I'm soldering off the reservoir tank. I decided not to use like uh, thread compound because it's just a huge pain in the ass at this size. You need massive wrenches and a lot of torque. But uh, I just wanted to point out, this Linux solder has got to be some of the best stuff I've ever used. I am so going out and finding some of this stuff today. If I can't find it, I'm going to order it online. This stuff is awesome. It flows so nicely on steel. It flows better than uh, or the same as the lead, the lead tin, 6040. But it's lead free, which is good because, you know, what if you got to grind on this stuff or something, you know, you don't want to have to put up with that so yeah in the past I've just learned it's better to just solder these damn things together um, it is a nightmare trying to get these completely leak free with uh, Teflon tape or thread compound so that's why I've done this but I just wanted to point out that this is some great solder I've never used it before until now I do have some of their snips though, but uh, this is where we are on the build. We've got the regulator hooked up. Air will go in this direction here. We will be able to adjust the regulator. I'm gonna just probably thread that and put a bolt in there to close that hole. Or I might just run a weld bead right there. Probably be quicker if I did that. This here, um, it's probably going to be bolted off also. I don't really need that port. And I'm going to be adding this fill port here, which is where you'll be able to dump the oil in. I might um, put a vent valve right here so you can open a vent valve while you're putting the oil in. That'll allow a nice good flow or the water, whatever you're filling this thing up with. 
Just a thought though. Hopefully I'll have this thing done today. Sometimes these builds take a little bit longer than we expect. But uh, I'm definitely gonna be swapping out the transducer. I've decided that I'm gonna just take the 120 PSI transducer off of that compressor there and run with that. Do a little review on solder today. I was unable to replace my Lennox solder. This is a lead-free solder. I do not know if this is silver bearing or not. However, I can tell you that this solder right here is the best solder I've ever used. And I was unable to replace it. I'll, I'll get to that later, but today I'm gonna do a quick review on this burns o -Matic Metalwork solder. I'm pretty sure I used this stuff once before and it was horrible. I do like the 430 degree Fahrenheit aspect of it. Now it says silver bearing. That's kind of hype in my opinion sometimes because the fact they didn't give us the actual ratio is kind of uh, ticks me off a little bit. It's a little bit fraudulent in my opinion. Secondly, silver solder is not all that great stuff to work with. It's just, the silver solder I've used in the past is an actual pain in the ass to use. You gotta have really high heats and all that stuff, I know, but. Today we're just gonna do a quick little uh, solder joint on this spud. And um, I got one other spot. I was actually even thinking about hitting this with some solder, even though it might damage my relief valve. Cause I don't think uh, Teflon tape's gonna seal that bad boy. So I just wanna see how this stuff does on a quick joint. And uh, so yeah, let's check it out. I've got an absolute mess going here today. I kind of think I need to put a needle valve on here instead. I'm on the fence. So, if I... All right, I'm sorry for the mess, fellas. I hope you can see that okay. I am in the heat of the battle right here. So, I have got every tool I have needed today on this table. It's gonna be quite the cleanup. So here we go. This is the uh, Metalwork burns a matic Last time I used this stuff, it was horrible. <laughs> a little better this time around it's got a nice flow to it now I have used a lot of solders too and I've done a lot of soldering in my day I'm not a plumber but I am a fabricator and uh, it's disappointing I couldn't replace that Linux solder today that stuff is amazing and it doesn't claim to have silver in it or nothing like that it's just straight up Okay, yeah, this stuff's a little bit problematic here. Lead solder would have just... Now, the reason why you see me just keep stabbing it with solder is for two reasons. I'm doing something called the braiding, which is actually physically scraping off any oxide layers. And secondly, we're introducing more flux into the area. That's the main purpose of that. I know it looks like I'm wasting solder, but I'm actually washing the part as we go by doing that. The reason why I didn't just do a standard compression fitting on this particular thing is because after using this stuff for so many years, I've come to the conclusion that it's just not good for anything over 30 some PSIs. It's really not. It, uh, They leak damn near no matter what you do, and it just gets old. Putting a bunch of machinery together and then walking through and tightening up 
four or five of these things, that gets to be a real pain in the ass, especially when you're pumping, you know, caustic solutions or stuff like that. So I just solder them anymore. I don't even bother. They just, they leak, it, especially if it's a gas. This is just some, some Menards hardware here, you know, this stuff isn't, it's not all that great. Maybe you can get them to work, but I can't. So, I don't know. It didn't do too bad. I haven't tried it on steel yet. I will go ahead and get a clip of this stuff working on some steel here later on. Um, but yeah, for that, it gave me a little problem on the bottom. Oh, wait a second, I spoke too soon. Take that back. I'm not liking the solder. See that right there, it didn't join. Now I know I didn't clean that part or nothing very well, but um, I did give it a little brush. Typically a standard like lead, a 60-40 solder, just has no problems whatsoever adhering to parts. Yeah, that's a pretty horrible flow right there, guys. Sorry. Yeah, that is just a piss poor flow. This, uh, yeah, it's working the same way it did last time. Um, so if you're interested in picking some of this up. Okay, this stuff's definitely going on the don't buy list. <laughs> lead some good lead acid would have uh, sealed that bad boy up right quick so no failed the test failed the damn test I'm never buying this stuff again if you want some good solder fellas this is the stuff now I don't go lead free for environmental reasons my purpose is is health concern sometimes I have to uh, do a little machining on stuff that I built, you know, and lead particles are just not a very fun thing to breathe in, in my opinion. So I've been staying away from the acid core lead solder, even though it, it, it is probably the best flowing solder there is, and that's why it's still around. For instance, this stuff right here, some uh, 60 lead, 4010. This is, um, where is that made? Hecko? Anyway, <clears throat> this is some pretty good solder. But like I said, once you get it on the parts, uh, you're done. You can't grind on it or nothing. And it's very weak, very susceptible to heat shock, very low melting point. So I've moved on to this stuff here and I'm just amazed how well it works. However, no store carries this. So I'm gonna put a link in the description of where you can get this. And I'm also gonna buy some off of Amazon. And I'm gonna do a little solder showdown to see what is the best stuff. Because um, it, it'd just be nice to know. I've always wanted to know what is the best solder. And over the years of using a bunch of junk, I am now in a position where I can provide that information. I'm going to be doing the same thing with these cutting discs too. I came across these really nice German cutoff wheels. This here is called a duo disc. Onyx. It does stainless steel also. It's a little bit thicker. But I've never seen German cutoff wheels. There's another one. Check that out, man. I'm interested to see how durable they are. This costs 99 cents. Or maybe it was this one. This one was a dollar. This was three dollars. So we'll be doing a lot of stuff like that. But in the meantime, I don't think I'm a fan of burns matic solder products anymore. They do make a mean torch though. Definitely liking this thing and it has a lifetime warranty. Got quite a few videos on that also. Now fellas, before you beat me up too bad in the comments, I want you to understand something. What that demonstration showed was that 
this solder didn't work on a poorly prepared joint. Some of you may tell me that. The reason why I didn't prepare that joint is because I know lead solder well enough to, to know what it will and will not do. And I can tell you right now that regular acid core solder would have just soldered this stuff up no problem with no cleaning or nothing. I've had no problems with it. And this stuff, I did clean up some of these parts and it still didn't stick very well. But regardless of that, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is the fact that it didn't do well on a, a, a fairly poorly prepared surface tells me that it's not gonna do well in, in some other scenarios as well. You just kind of get a feel for the stuff. This stuff probably won't silver solder metal very good. I'm gonna try that real quick, but um, it's, it's just kind of a, you get a sense of it. If it does really well on poorly prepared surfaces, it's gonna be a good solder. This stuff will do that. This stuff will not. So it's just, I'm not saying that um, it's the worst solder in the world. I mean, it, it did work, but you just gotta really clean the parts. And let's be honest, who the hell has time to, to do all that sometimes, especially when you're just building something. I mean, I just, I want to get this damn thing together. I don't have time for all that nonsense, but uh, just a thought on the subject. So I'm just getting ready to throw some JB Weld on this pressure relief valve. Here's where I am in the build. I have got quite the mess going on here, man. We'll step back and take a look at this thing here in a second. Progress is underway. This is gonna take me all freaking day, I know it. Okay, fellas, it's the next day. Here we are, we're getting ready to test this bad boy out. I'm getting ready to dump all of this waste oil that has been gravity filtered. I have not filtered it. This thing can handle some pretty dirty stuff, so I'm not worried about clogging up just yet. Um, I'm going to dump this entire container in here, and I have some graduated buckets that I got cleaning out that we're going to observe the flow rates that are on this thing. And just to give you one more once over of, of what we have here and how this thing works, basically this compressor fills up this reservoir tank. 235 psi's i believe that's the cutoff of this transducer I'm, I'm thinking it cuts back on at 100 psi's and we are running that pressure to a pressure regulator which is then connected to the tank which will enable us to pressurize the tank at a specific pressure and a specific flow rate now what this does is increases the pressure head on the oil Let's go over this diagram one more time. We have the compressor, which fills up the reservoir, which is in series with the regulator, which pressurizes this tank, which increases the pressure head of the fluid, and the fluid then travels up this siphon straw, is what, the, what this would be called, the technical term. Like if that's in any straw going down into a pressurized tank, say it be a propane refill tank or a CO2 refiller tank, that's called a siphon. And basically, that's where we're gonna get our regulated flow. This device should allow me to dial in very specific flow rates of oil. My target being on the order of one gallon per hour at 100 PSI's. I need some pressure behind this stuff. And as we've already discussed, pulling that off is somewhat of a feat. It's not as easy as you think. So. Let's get on with this test. I'm going to set up a rig to connect to this end. This is the discharge port of the unit. And um, we'll be getting on with it here shortly. All right, all of this will make a big mess. I forgot to put a bleeder valve on this thing. Oops. Yeah, this is going to be kind of messy. there we are it seems like it was some fairly clean stuff so here we go maiden voyage just want to test it out first at 80 psi on the regulator I have also added this gauge 
in series with the nozzle because the pressure reading on the regulator and the pressure reading past this point is not going to be the same. So I'm going to go ahead and hook this up. I don't know how well you guys will be able to see the test. But we're going to check this oil pump out. And there's really not any room. Okay, here we go. I'm going to crack the valve. There's the oil. Moving right along. I'm liking it. I'm going to get a pressure reading here any second. And there it goes. Okay, that is... Man, I got some steam in this thing. Looks like I'm on about 30 PSI's. And we're on 80 PSI's on the regulator. And that's what the spray jet looks like. I wonder if it's clogged. That's odd. Yeah, I've already got a piece of debris in there. Dang it, I'm gonna shut it off a second. Yeah, something has already clogged my orifice. <laughs> How disappointing. Yepper. Man, that sucks. It's doing like this snake tongue deal. Shooting out all crooked. So give me a second on that. Well, that's disappointing. There might not be nothing stuck in there. At any rate, I'm going to try and clear it out real quick. With an air compressor. Let's just look at the flow like this for a second and see. Yeah, I don't want to waste all my oil. I don't want to have to recharge this just yet. Let me uh, work this thing here. Be very careful here. Okay, the sucker should be cleared out. I mean, I'm like stepping in oil. So not too cool. I was really hoping for a better spray pattern out of this nozzle. Still got a funky angle to it, that's weird. Why is it doing that? Well, that's at uh, full thrust. The pressure is at about 60 psi, like that. Take that back, about 75 psi. Regulator pressure is still at 80. I'm going to take you down off the mount a second. Take a look. So it is pumping oil really well. You can see the pressure we're at there. 
Now that pressure will reduce if I throttle this. Because we're at a different flow rate now. So the pressure's been reduced. So I get almost an infinite level of control. Now this nozzle is very poor and it's not gonna be the nozzle I'm gonna use in my waste oil burner. I'm just testing the system out. See, we're still sticking at the 80 PSI's in the tank. In the reservoir, this cylinder here is still sitting over 120 PSI's. So this thing can pump forever without even kicking on. Like hardly no air is being used up pumping this small amount of oil. So let's turn it down just a little bit more. See, I'm almost at no pressure there. But it is pumping. No, it isn't. Let's open it up just a touch. Let's see that. So yeah, the pressure setting is, is infinite. I can dial this in on any pressure I want. The flow rate aspect might be a little tricky. I've got some steam in my gauge is why we can't see that. But uh, yeah, I think as soon as I find a good nozzle, this is gonna make a very good pump. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the pressure up. And that's gonna cause the uh, unit to Okay, so we are now at 100 PSI on the regulator. And I am going to crank this thing open, wide open, to see if we get a better spray action. I may get hit with some oil here. That is quite a powerful jet of oil there. Nice. I'm almost wondering if introducing air into this stream would cause an awesome oil vaporizer. Okay, what I'm going to do now, ooh, let's check this pressure here. I got to get that steam out of there. So we're at about 75 psi. We've already seen that. Let's open it up all the way. Still stuck at that 75 psi mark. <clears throat> that might be the max at this setting. Nice little pump to it though. Okay, I think that's max flow. Still refusing to go over 75 PSI's. My regulator's not quite at 100. I'm gonna dial it in. there the hose slipped out of my connection so I'll be doing some retooling on that <laughs> I'm gonna put a copper line on that thing for sure 100 psi is a little bit more than that connection could take and I sprayed about 20,000 gallons of oil on the bright side everything in this section of the building has been completely rust protected or rust proof for a few years to come. <laughs> Man, dude, that stuff was spraying out of there like you wouldn't believe, guys. It was like a rocket engine. I really wish I would have caught the footage so we could see the potential of this thing. <laughs> it didn't lose hardly any pressure. When it did it, it uh, man, it was really flying out of there. I remember I had it open all the way. The uh, size of the jet was the exact size of that orifice and it began to separate from the high velocity so we just had oil shooting out of this thing at 100 psi it really stinks in here you think that wasn't gas or something 
it could have got kind of ugly. That's quite a big mess. I, I really wish I would have had the foresight to uh, aim that in a different direction. We'll do the rest of the test like that. <laughs> so it sprays that way. Son of a bitch. Oh well, I need to throw a lot of that stuff away anyway. I really do. But um, that's where we're at on this build. Something has clogged my nozzle again. This nozzle is way too temperamental. So I'm going to uh, mess with this thing a little bit. I'm considering putting an inline filter before that nozzle. And uh, yeah, so far from what little bit that I've seen, guys, we have an infinite control between the parameters of zero to about 120 PSI. We can control the pressure and the flow rate. The pressure is controlled by this. Flow rate is controlled by that and with these two in tandem we were able to dial in a very specific flow rate so this thing's going to work out awesome as an oil pump and from uh, what i've seen it's got more than enough capacity it takes hardly no air at all to pump that little bit of oil so this thing's also going to work great for a water pump for a steam cleaner that i'm building me and a guy was talking about putting together a commercial device that's cheaper than 500 dollars and it's very small and that's what I'm going to be doing with this unit here. But first I wanted to examine its potential as an oil pump. Because you need an oil tank anyway. Might as well just have this thing in one unit like this. But uh, I had to uh, dead man my safety valve. Not too worried about safety, obviously, at this point with this thing. But... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call this quits on this video, guys, because this is already like 40 hours long. But uh, that's where we're at. Next time you see this thing, it's going to have a little bit of improvements. I'm going to know better than to connect that here and run it over 100 PSI. And I'm thinking about purchasing a really nice oil atomizer nozzle from a company I've been researching, and we'll talk about that. In the meantime, fellas, this device is a success. It pumps oil at extremely small flow rates, at extremely precise pressures. Exactly what I need for a waste oil burner pump. This is also exactly what I need for my steam coil. If you haven't checked out those videos, I'll leave a link in the description, but this little bad boy right here puts off a nasty steam jet when you hook this on the end of a propane tank and you pump a small amount of water through it. We're talking like half gallon an hour. <laughs> Very small flow rates. So there we are. I've got a fantastic mess. That's where the blast actually hit. I hurried up and picked that up before it became an issue, but uh, that's all she won't. I am out of here. I'm going in the house. I'm not even cleaning this up. I've been out here for like 80 hours. And I gotta go to work tomorrow. I already put in a week's work. <laughs>